Chris used to work for Microsoft. So, as he said to me, he saw the light some years ago, but he's now founder for, of the Centre of Technology Policy Research um, and also a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. And the reason I got Jerry along is because I think he's done a lot of work both at both ends of the spectrum. He's been in industry, but he's also worked in the political dimension and actually has been in the UK helping the parliamentary select group to do an audit of what's been going on in government in these areas. So he's actually very well positioned to make some comments on that. And almost he's the middle ground on that. Uh, the next person up there is somebody many of you will know, which is Peter Strict, who's the CTO from FedEx here in Belgium. And I got uh, Peter come along because I think Peter has been a very strong advocate of openness in general and been a supporter of many of the things there. But he's also a pragmatist, and he's one of the guys that actually has to put it and make it work. So he's not going to get anybody thanking him if it's all lovely ideals, but actually he's not going to be able to deliver what is necessary. Um, and the last person there, which again many of you know, um, is Andy Updegrove. Andy is uh, a lawyer by training, I think. He's based in Boston and is probably the global blogger on openness, the use of open standards. Has a huge uh, blog, which I, I'm sure Andy will tell me afterwards, or perhaps now, is just how many readers it has. But I think it is probably the largest read blog in the whole area of openness. So thank you for coming, gentlemen. Um, do you agree with Andrew DeMeyer? Uh, <clears throat> shall I kick off? I, I, I don't quite understand where he goes with some of his logic, because on the one hand he says quite accurately that governments are facing quite severe economic circumstances and almost implies that is why open everything is a bad idea. And actually, that's almost the inverse of where I come from, because I actually think if you look at the current economic environment, open everything seems a very powerful lever for governments to be pulling. Uh, if you take a recent uh, UK committee report, it recommended that any company dealing with the public sector should have to openly publish details of their uh, commercial arrangement so that it could be open to public scrutiny, uh, which they saw as a key lever both of uh, demonstrating uh, integrity and hopefully building some trust that doesn't currently exist, but also of providing a, a competitive stimulus in the market. So I, I'm not clear with some of the, uh, well, I guess the lack of logic that Andrea De Meo seems to follow in his piece. But do, do you, you know, again, I'm going to keep pushing all three of you on some of these points because do you actually feel that there is ministerial support, you know, okay, the UK is the example you just gave, but is there ministerial support to drive it through and actually say this is a priority and it's going to make it happen because it's nice words and it, it looks good on election thing but I suspect five years in um, maybe it's not top of their priority list. I, I think it, it, it's still there and it's quite interesting watching different administrations come into power and the difference between any politicians in opposition and when they actually arrive and the reality of what they can implement there is always a divergence. But if you look at the Open Data Institute that's being set up in the UK with Nigel Shabbat and other people involved with that to commit to yeah. getting data open, um, there's a commitment to actually begin to publish. And in fact, more, more data is already being published. The target is to publish every single uh, commitment over £25,000 that central government makes with a supplier. So it is happening. It's probably not as fast as a lot of us might wish. OK, well, let's just see what the other guys say first of all, and then we'll come back to that, I think. Peter. Okay, uh, that will be an interesting discussion because I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Jerry. Um, I think it's, it's very strange in the, the text from uh, Andrea that he says yeah, government should be thinking about their budgets and uh, lots of other stuff besides openness. And openness is not on the top of the agenda. And I can agree with that. It's not on the top of the agenda. It's sharing is on the top of the agenda. Uh, one of the programs that our minister, uh, Henrik Bogart, launched was OptiFed, optimizing the federal government. It's all about shared services, about sharing data, sharing infrastructure. Now, how can you share if your environment is not open? And so, although openness is not at the number one priority list, sharing and mutualization of, of infrastructure is, and you can only do that if you have an open environment. And so open for us is not only about 
sharing, it's about innovation. Uh, FedEx software development for the electronic identity card is open source from the beginning. And so we had some very interesting side effects and benefits that we never at the front of, the, of this initiative uh, thought that would be possible were, were realized. Uh, so uh, collaboration with Portugal, for example, was one of them. But we have a whole range of other benefits of, of being open. Uh, again, the interoperability effect is there. Uh, driving costs down is there. The exit costs are way lower. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, things that openness know. It's not number one on the priority list, but a lot of other things are, but they all somehow built on this foundation of openness. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody just say a few things first of all, and I'll try and challenge some of them. Because Andy. I think there's a, a, a few points that are worth making. The first is, is that openness can't be looked at just as an economic issue. Uh, openness is a little bit like building maintenance. Uh, you think you can let the roof go for a year or two and then catch up later. But openness in government isn't really like a roof because things happen every day. And it's a value of government that's been established through hundreds of years. And if you're not true to your values, it's easy to let the roof go and start to get some leaks. So I think to only talk about uh, the economics is to miss a very central point when we're talking about government. Uh, the second thing is, is that, yes, you can add open to anything, but that doesn't make them all the same. There's a separate business case and a separate set of rationales in each, uh, each case, and you can't really conflate them all together and say that they're the same. Uh, open source uh, has to do with uh, costs of uh, 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 provision services. It has to do with competition in the marketplace. On the other hand, open government hasn't anything to do with it. It has to do with being true to the values that you put forth for the people. Open data is something else again. It has an element of transparency. It also has an element of opportunity for, uh, for commerce. Uh, open standards can be a way to achieve government policy. Uh, so all of these things have separate business cases, and in each of them, it's only partially an economic concern. So I think that it misses the boat uh, in, in two senses. It's, it's unfair to the business case in each case, and it leaves aside the special concerns of government as compared to commerce when they speak of openness. Yeah, to be, to, to be fair to Andrew DeMayo, because it, and we did invite him, obviously, to speak, but he's actually in South Africa this uh, week, so he couldn't make it, which is why I wanted to make sure we, we gave him a, you know, we covered his points. But he made a, his, one of the points and quotes he put is that, should governments not adopt openness without question unless they possess the culture to encourage the so unselfish collaboration that is essential for success? Um, do we really think there is that culture in place in government? And when I say government, I don't necessarily mean national government. It could be local government or, or state government or whatever, depending on which country. So is there that culture in existence? Peter, you know. Uh, I, I think, again, uh, referring to, to uh, Andy's statement, uh, it has to do with what type of openness are you talking about? Are you talking about open source? Mm -hmm. There you need a, a special culture of, of openness, uh, community building, and so forth. And I agree that that perhaps uh, not everybody in government is up to using open source as a way to build communities. Yeah? But with open data and open standards, it's a whole different business case. And yes, I, I, I don't agree with Andrea that, that government is not up to that. Uh, I'm convinced that open standards and, and open data are, s uh, the business case is there, and it, it, it's not particularly tied to the collaboration or the culture within government. It is not. Okay. Jerry, would you, could you agree? Yes, and I think if you take the, the, the case of open data, if you, if you look typically at most governments, they've, they've grown up in quite a siloed way, even within a particular government department, you might find different systems uh, that contain the same information as systems sitting alongside them. And then as you look across government, it gets even worse. <clears throat> and I think it's another angle that Andreas overlooked is the value of open inside government as much as externally, which is how uh, do government departments, if you think about providing better services to citizen businesses, how do they get smarter about more efficient data and information management internally? And a lot of that is about opening up these historic vertical silos um, that might be quite fit to one narrow specific 
um, policy purpose, but actually don't meet the need for a much more efficient and effective way of delivering sort of 21st century digital services. So I think there's a whole element missing from his blogs, which is around the internal value of open. Andy? Well, I think what struck me when I read uh, that article was that he was only talking about culture and government. And whenever some new opportunity opens up that is, is, is rich in possibilities, but also brand new, you can't really anticipate the values that people are going to find in it. And in the US, there's rather a different attitude that the private sector is ready to pounce on data when it becomes available. So I almost wondered whether the more important thing to talk about was the culture in the private sector, not so much that government should make it easy for you to capitalize on this, but you should be willing to invest in the private sector in accessing uh, that data. Uh, I think if you do expose the data, obviously it depends on the type of data, but certainly many types of data, there's great value there that innovation and uh, the private sector can take advantage of if they're attuned to doing that. But relatedly, uh, one last quick point, the, um, it's a one-time conversion cost. And I think that this can be lost too, that yes, it's expensive in the moment, but once it's enabled, and once you make the investment in the open standards to be able to prepare the data and, and then present it in the future, you have a long payback period without additional significant investment. So just picking out that point about you know, the government's role in, in encouraging innovation and, and the link, because I think one of the lessons learned from Chesborough is the fact is about building a whole network. And part of the thing is actually is government seeing that its role is to encourage that external network. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to hear what Neely Crow says this morning in her presentation, because I suspect that what she is going to be talking is about the role of the Commission and its use of its research funding to encourage that innovation in the sector. So do we see that is happening? You know, you, you, you're based the other side of the pond. Do you see that activity is happening in the States? Is, is there that engagement with the, with the industry to create the innovative effect of, for example, opening up uh, government data? Well, I think the, the private sector has a quite a long history, as I say, of the expectation of access to the results of tax funding. So whether it be research or whether it be creation of data, for example, at the end of the Cold War, a tremendous amount of geophysical data was exposed, everything from the entire mapping of the sea bottom, uh, weather data. And there's very much a culture in society of being able to get that data in any form and then making the investment to make something out of it. So as I say, I think it's, it's uh, perhaps the cultural issue is more in the private sector. The government, you know, on, on the US side, we would say that's not really necessarily the role of the government. That's the role of